So today we have a very beautiful chapter, John chapter 15, which speaks about the vine and the branches. So in order to understand this a little better, we need to go back uh, to the book of Isaiah, where Isaiah talks about the vineyard. So what is this vineyard, what it is all about? Um, if we understand that background, then when Jesus speaks about uh, the vine and the branches, we we'll get a better understanding. So, I share with you uh, Isaiah. So you can see my screen, right? Yeah. Yes. So see what uh, it says. Isaiah chapter 5. Let me sing for my beloved a love song concerning his vineyard. My beloved had a vineyard on a very fertile hill. He digged it and cleared it of stones and planted it with choice vines. He built a watchtower in the midst of it and hewed out a wine vat in it. And he looked for it to yield grapes but it yielded wild grapes. And now, O inhabitants of Jerusalem and men of Judah, judge, I pray you, between me and my vineyard. What more was there to do for my vineyard that I have not done in it? When I looked for it to yield grapes, why did it yield wild grapes? Now I will tell you what I will do to my vineyard. I will remove its hedge and it shall be devoured. I will break down its wall and it shall be trampled down. I will make it a waste. It shall not be pruned or hoed, and briars and thorns shall grow up. And I will also command the clouds that they rain no rain upon it. Now comes the key verse. For the vineyard of the Lord of hosts is the house of Israel. And the men of Judah are his pleasant planting. And he looked for justice, but behold bloodshed. For righteousness, but behold a cry. So you see, when you talk about the vine and the vineyard, you know, the vineyard is representative of Israel because almost every other house in Israel would have a little vineyard. And uh, the Lord says Israel is that vineyard and uh, God is the one who takes care of the vineyard and uh, he expected it to bear fruit, but it didn't. It says in the last verse, he says, he looked for justice, but behold, bloodshed. See, that's what we see even today in Israel. See, we are looking for justice, but then we only see bloodshed, killing one another, destroying one another for righteousness, but behold, a cry. So we only hear, you know, people wailing and weeping and screaming instead of there being righteousness, instead of there being justice. There's only bloodshed, there's violence, there's injustice, there's killing. So God wanted his people to bear fruit. And that is why he also gives that other parable of the tenants where they destroy, every, they kill all the servants and finally they want to kill the son. And so the owner of the vineyard he says he was going to throw out these people and give the vineyard to those who will bear fruit. So in other words, the kingdom of Israel will be, kingdom of God will be taken away from Israel and given to a people who will bear its fruit. Now this extends to us today. So if as Christians, if God has chosen us to be the new Israel and if we do not bear fruit, give it to someone else who will bear fruit. So the onus is now on us to bear fruit. So that's the key verse here when we talk about the vineyard. Okay, so keeping this in mind, let's uh, go back to our original passage in John chapter 15. So now Jesus says, I am the true vine and my father is the vine dresser. So Jesus is that main uh, vine in the vineyard. If you see the uh, vine that is growing, Jesus says, I am the true vine. That is the main trunk of the vine. No, 
and every branch of mine that bears no fruit the father takes away and every branch that does bear fruit he prunes that it may bear more fruit so there is only one thing here you should be a fruit bearing branch so whichever branch does not bear fruit it is cut off and the one which bears fruit is pruned so that it bears more fruit so basically to be a fruit bearing tree because otherwise why do you have a vine if it is just wasting away the soil and not giving fruit so the whole focus here that jesus is giving is on bearing fruit now he says in order that you have to bear fruit what should you do what should the branch do in order that it should bear fruit all the time see he says you are already made clean by the word which i have spoken to you so that means you have been cleansed you have been um, pruned you have been made you know all ready to bear fruit everything has been done by jesus himself you are already made clean by the word which i have spoken to you so god's word has been given to us that has cleansed us and it is now prepared us to do his will so what do we have to do next he says abide in me and i in you so this means a complete union with the vine the branch has to be completely united with the vine it cannot try to grow by itself you know so there is no uh, breaking away from the main trunk from the vine so a christian a disciple is invited to abide in the vine to be part of this vine and to take all the strength it needs all the all the nutrients it needs from the vine as the branch cannot bear fruit by itself unless it abides in the vine neither can you unless you abide in me now here comes something mind blowing uh you see when i look at myself and i say i should bear fruit i should bear fruit i must realize that i on my own cannot bear fruit no matter how much i try you know i will be uh, useless and worthless and cannot really bear fruit unless i am soaked i am completely immersed in jesus so who is it that makes me bear fruit is jesus because he is the vine and all this fruit bearing in me will happen when i have completely given myself to him that means i have lesser and lesser of myself and more and more of jesus within me so what happens is i become more like jesus and when jesus starts filling me he starts coming into me completely i start bearing fruit so the more i have the lord in me the more fruit bearing i will be the more i have of myself the lesser will i bear fruit so neither can you bear fruit unless you abide in me so the word that is the main word here is to abide to abide in him that means to be rooted in jesus to be soaked in him to be part of him if my life is not rooted in jesus then i'm wasting my time you know i'm doing a lot of activity i'm doing a lot of things but eventually they don't bear fruit so in order that i may really bear fruit i have to abide in jesus and then automatically the fruit will come you know people around me can see the fruit they can see it happening all i need to do is to abide 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 in the vine so jesus makes it very very clear apart from me you can do nothing so i am the vine you are the branches he who abides in me and i in him he it is that bears much fruit for apart from me you can do nothing so the branch in itself is not a very uh, <coughs> powerful thing in itself it's not powerful it's not fruitful by itself because it is attached to the vine because it gets all its strength and nutrients from the vine it is constantly bearing fruit the moment it says okay 
I seem to be a very good branch. I seem to be doing very well and it cuts off from the vine. It will immediately start drying up and that could also happen to us because there are moments when we think, oh, I am talented, I am smart, I am clever, I am intelligent. I have a lot of uh, things which I can do on my own. Once I say this, I cut myself off from the vine. And then what happens is I become fruitless. And all my effort becomes meaningless. And therefore, this awareness should constantly be in me that I am soaked in the vine. If I am not soaked in the vine, if I am not part of that vine, I become a useless branch. So if a man, if a person does not abide in me, what happens? He or she is cast forth as a branch and withers. The branches are gathered, thrown into the fire and burnt. So this is for someone who does not abide in Jesus. You begin to wither. Your life becomes dry and eventually you are going towards your death. Which means uh, finally, you know, your whole purpose in life is wasted. Whereas the next verse says, if you abide in me and my words abide in you. That means if abiding in Jesus means doing what he wants me to do. That is when he says, that is why he says my words abide in you. Which means all that Jesus has said, I begin to put into practice. That is when his words abide in me. So if Jesus says, love one another as I have loved you, I start doing this in my daily life. I start putting it into practice. Then what happens? Ask whatever you will and it shall be done for you. Very clear, no? Very simple as well. The moment I am soaked in Jesus, what will I ask for? I will only ask for things that are really needed and I will ask in faith because I know the one in whom I have trusted and I know that he loves me and he will do it for me. And so I ask with confidence and I will only ask for things that are needful, that are needed and not for things which are useless. So automatically I will begin to ask for things that would really further God's kingdom in our lives. And so in whatever I ask, Jesus says it will be done for you. No two ways about it. There's no 50-50 there's no 90% uh, chance. No. The moment you ask for something, it will be done. So that is the promise that God gives us in his word. So once we abide in him and you know we start living out the values of the kingdom in our life, whatever we ask God, he is ready to grant it for us because we are asking him according to the mind of God. And that is how we will ask the moment we abide in him. So this abiding is so important. With, without this, you know, whatever else we try to do in our lives, you know, here and there, now and then, all that eventually will not lead us to the kingdom. What will lead us to the kingdom is abiding in him, clinging on to him, no matter what. You know, that is why our whole life should, you know, be focused on furthering God's kingdom should be focused on knowing the master and constantly communing with the master and growing in him. So I, I should desire to become more and more like Jesus every day. Every day there should be a progress. I shouldn't go backwards. No, one day I go forward and then next day I go backward is not the way of a Christian. It's like, you know, walking on a treadmill where I have to constantly keep going forward. The moment I stop, I will fall back. See, I have to constantly be on the move. I have to keep going ahead. So I need to grow more and more into the person of Jesus. And that is when I become fruit bearing. By this, so when you start bearing fruit, when you start abiding in Jesus, what happens? My father is glorified. That you bear much fruit and so prove to be my disciples. Beautiful, no? So, if you abide in Jesus, automatically you will bear fruit and the Father is glorified. And this is a very clear proof 
that you are a disciple of Jesus. You don't have to say anything. You don't have to do anything. People looking at you will have to say you are a disciple of Jesus. It's like you look at a mango tree and the whole world can understand. When they see a mango tree, it is a mango tree. It can't bear some other fruit. You know, in one season it starts giving guavas and another season it gives something else. No. Throughout the year, 365 days of the year, a mango tree will only bear mangoes. And so when you become a fruitful person, people who look at you automatically know you are a disciple of Jesus. So that is when the father is glorified. You see, so this is our calling. And so this chapter of John is so important for us you not know, to abide because anything else that we do, you know, we'll have to stem from this, from our knowledge of God, from our union with God, from our, you know, being attached to him. From this comes our whole life, our whole purpose. You see, as the father has loved me, so have I loved you. Abide in my love. Beautiful. The father loves Jesus and Jesus loves us in the same way. And therefore, he says with this love, I want you to abide in me. See, this love of God has been poured into our hearts. In Romans 5, 5, we read God's love has been poured into our hearts by the Holy Spirit who has been given to us. So at baptism, you and I have received God's spirit in fullness. And this love of God is within us. We don't have to look outside. It's there within us. And Jesus says, I have loved you with this love. And therefore, he says, abide in my love. You know, don't go away from this love. You know, that love is there in you. All that the branch has to do is just to remain with the vine. That's all. It shouldn't desire to cut itself off for any moment to think, you know, I can bear and manage on my own. No, the branch has to constantly cling on to the vine. Jesus says, abide in me, cling on to me all the time. Don't for a moment think that you can manage on your own. So if I keep abiding in him, then I begin to bear fruit and further God's kingdom. Verse 10, if you keep my commandments, you will abide in my love, just as I have kept my father's commandments and abide in his love. Now, what is this commandment? Commandment is nothing but love. That is the love commandment that Jesus finally gives us. See, so what Jesus says is very simple. Love God and love your neighbor as yourself. So love one another with the love that I have given you. Love one another as I have loved you. Once we do this, we will realize that automatically we will start bearing fruit. And why does Jesus say all this? He says, these things I have spoken to you that my joy may be in you and that your joy may be full. So here we have someone who is the source of our joy. See, joy is something that shows on our face. You know, the moment we love, there will be joy on our face. Only a loveless person will also be a joyless person. If there is real love in your heart, it shows in your face as joy. You see, once you experience God's love in your heart, that love automatically translates into action and the sign it shows on the outward face is joy. You know, the moment you begin to, you know, experience this love and want to share this love, it shows up as joy and people can see this in you. It will be uh, very visible. It's not something you have to try to put on. It's not something that comes now and then. It's the constant glow that will be on your face. So my joy will be, when, will be in you and my joy in you will be complete, will be full. That is why Jesus says, I've told you all this. Now you need to be aware of this, Jesus says. Because my love has been poured into your heart. Start loving one another as I have loved you. And once you do this, this joy within you will start flowing and it will go to others. It won't remain with you. 
this joy has to spread it has to spread all over the world like wildfire and it has to touch every person on the planet earth so this is given to us that it may be shared this is not something that is to be kept to oneself so love is something that has to be given it has to be shared see that is why god loves you know because god needs an object for loving so you can't just keep it to yourself that is why he created us and so every creature of god is loved by god that love of god extends into all his creatures and these creatures in turn have to share this love with everyone that's how love works love is not something that is bottled up and kept is not something that's closed it's something that is thrown out and shared given to everyone freely unconditionally you know not expecting anything in return that is the very nature of love god's divine nature is love and that nature has been given to us and so it should become natural for us to share this love okay this is my commandment that you love one another as i have loved you so he repeats what he said in the previous chapter he says love one another as i have loved you that is his commandment nothing else you don't have to think about the 10 commandments no jesus says you love one another that is all we need in our lives that is why st augustine will say love god and do what you please because the moment you love god you will not do anything that will hurt him you will not do anything that will hurt your neighbor and you will not do anything that will hurt yourself because love is something that is so powerful so beautiful and it can only do good it cannot do harm you see love cannot harm the other so when there is true love in your heart you know that you can never harm or hurt your neighbor no matter what so that is why all these wars and fights have no justification you see you can never justify a war you can't say you know that person is an enemy i need to kill him destroy him no that means we are not loving god only loves and he wants us to only love not to kill not to destroy not to hate because love is something that we need to give to the whole of human kind all the time so we have to love everyone all the time remember this we have to love everyone all the time so no one is excluded and there is no boundary to this love so that is the very nature of love so if the moment there is a boundary the moment there are conditions it is no longer called love because the very definition of love is that it's free flowing it goes to everyone and it doesn't put up any boundary at all so that is the nature of god's love and that love has been poured into our hearts and jesus says just love love is given to us all we need to do is share this love and he goes on to speak about agape this agape is the sacrificial love that jesus showed to us on the cross so he says greater love has no man than this that a man lay down his life for his friends so that is the greatest form of love so when we think of love at various degrees jesus is the highest form of love is sacrificial love that jesus himself will show you know he not only talks about it he does it in action when he goes to the cross you know all this he is saying before he goes to the cross because very soon he will demonstrate this love on the cross so you are my friends if you do what i command you no longer do i call you servants you see so beautiful see god doesn't look at us as menial creatures he doesn't look at us as someone below his dignity someone who is low no he says i don't call you servants for a servant does not know what his master is doing but i have called you friends you see the word friends is so beautiful who is a friend someone i can whom i can share all my ideas and thoughts and feelings with so that is my friend as someone who is my equal someone who you know can understand me talk to me at my level and jesus says you are my friends i don't call you servants anymore see so you are not someone who is down and god is there up and he looks down on you no he says i have called you friends for all that i have heard from my father i have made known to you 
So there is nothing hidden from us anymore. God has revealed everything to us. He has revealed all that is there in the Father's heart to us. Can you imagine this? That God doesn't look at us as menial creatures, as somebody to be looked down upon. He doesn't condescend and say, you know, hey there. No. He calls us friends. So we are friends of God. Can you imagine this? When you say someone is a friend, now this friend will do anything for you, right? And God is that loving friend who wants to give even his life for you. That is his friendship with us. You see, the friendship extends to sacrifice. So that's the kind of love that the father extends to us. So I've called you friends for all that I've heard from my father. I have made known to you and going further, he says, you did not choose me. So it is not our choice that we said, OK, I'll make God my friend. No, God chose us and he says, I want to make you my friend. How wonderful that is. No? I chose you. I chose you and appointed you that you should go and bear fruit and that your fruit should abide. So that whatever you ask the father in my name, he may give it to you. So he chooses us. He appoints us. And he sends us out why to bear fruit and that this fruit should abide. That means it should be a constant bearing fruit. It's not something that happens now and stops. No, it should abide. It's an abiding fruit, which means it is not seasonal. It is not time bound. It is permanent. Fruit should abide. And what happens? Whatever we ask the father because he's my friend. So whatever I ask him, he gives it to us. That is the relationship God has with each one of us. This I command you to love one another again and again and again. Jesus reiterates this point that we need to love one another. This is a command is not just an option is not something he says do it if you like it. No, he says it's a command because only when we follow this Will our lives really have joy? Will our lives really have purpose, direction, meaning? Until then, our life will really not have that fullness. That fullness comes when we love one another. And that is why he commands us. He commands us. You know, he's commanding us. Why? Why? This is a commandment again in love, not something like a general commanding uh, some his soldiers. No. This is a love commandment. So when he commands us, it's a command in love. He says, please do it because if you don't do it, you're not going to experience real fulfillment in your life. And therefore, he says, I want you to do it. So love one another. And then he goes on to say, what are the repercussions of this? If the world hates you, you see the moment you start living like this as a disciple of Jesus, he says the world will start hating you because the world when you talk about the world, the world is talking about the sinful world because the world on the other hand. Wants to go away from God, live a godless life. That's the nature of the world because it follows the evil one and the evil one wants only destruction, only wants sadness, only wants people to be destroyed because that is his nature. And that is the way the world goes. The world goes behind. All these things that will take them to destruction, unfortunately. So what happens if the world hates you? Why does the world hate you? Because you are loving one another and you are living like a disciple of Jesus. The world hates you. He says if the world hates you, remember, know that it has hated me before it hated you. So you see, you're not the only one. You're not the first one. Remember, if the world starts hating you. The world has already hated Jesus. Jesus came, he pitched his tent among us. He lived among us. He spoke God's word. He told us about the father's love. What did the people do? How did they respond? They hated him. They were jealous of him. They wanted to do away with him and they sent him to the cross and finished him off. They thought he was finished. But then he rose again. So that's what the world wants to do to us. The moment we do. 
God's will in our life. We will be hated. And that again is a sign that we are doing God's will. If you don't do God's will, the world will love you and you'll be very comfortable. You will seem to be very happy because you'll go with the flow. Very easy. That is why Jesus says the broad path that leads to the broad path leads to destruction and many will go behind it. You see, there will be many, many, many people who will take the broad path to perdition. It's very easy to take the broad path. You go with the flow, you go with the current and the whole world is going in that direction. Very easy and everyone will put their ha hands around you and say, wow, come, come, come along. No problems at all. But the moment you swim against the current, ah, people will start hating you. People will start rejecting you, will oppose you, will make fun of you, will want to do away with you. Then you know, yes, you are following God. Then you know you are being a true disciple. That is a very clear sign. Remember what we just read recently on All Saints Day. Uh, you know, if people persecute you and, you know, they do all kinds of things against you, he says, rejoice and be glad. So the moment you start facing all this hatred and facing all this uh, uh, objection from people facing, you know, uh, all the bad things that people say about you, when you listen to all this, when you see all this, when you see people doing things against you, Jesus says, rejoice, rejoice, because you know you are being a disciple, you are following Jesus. What they did to Jesus, they are doing to you. And so you should say, wow, you know, I'm so proud to be a disciple of Jesus. What they did to my master, they're also doing to me. So, you know, I now know that I'm really following Jesus because that is a very clear sign for me that if I'm persecuted, if I'm, you know, uh, made fun of, if I am, you know, tortured, when all these things happen to me, I know that I am following my master. So if you are of the world, if you are of the world, the world would, would love its own. That is why I said they will put their arm around you and say, wow, come, 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 because you're going along with them. But because you are not of the world, but I chose you out of the world, therefore the world hates you. Remember this, another very clear sign for us. Are we going beautifully with the world is everything going fine with us that means we are heading towards destruction that's a warning sign for us so we need to immediately come back and see where am i am i going with the world or am i going with jesus probably i've taken the wrong route i've taken the wrong path let me get into the narrow path that jesus is inviting me to so I have to choose the narrow path and those who find it are few, Jesus says. Those who find this narrow path are few. Am I one of the few who has chosen the narrow path or am I like the majority who take the broad path to perdition? Every day I need to ask myself this question. Am I on the narrow path that leads to life or am I on the broad path that leads to perdition? Remember the word that I said to you. A servant is not greater than his master. If they persecuted me, <clears throat> they will persecute you. If they kept my word, they will keep yours also. You see, so <clears throat> if we are disciples of Jesus, they will persecute us. They will try to do away with us. Because we are following the truth and the world cannot stand the truth. No? So it only wants falsehood. We have to live in a, a, a world of fantasy. That is why people are craving after movies and our whole life becomes like a movie because all the time we are fantasizing and we want to have the movie world in our real lives. See, when people watch films, what happens is they want to... Uh, extend that into their real lives and that is when tragedy strikes you see because uh, the film stars i see the kind of life they live 
I want to have that kind of life. And when I don't have that, I'm disappointed. I'm frustrated and I want to end my life. So we are getting into the wrong path. We are getting into the wrong path that leads to destruction. So that is why Jesus says, come back, come back to the path that leads to life. Come back to the narrow path. So if they persecuted me, they will persecute you. If they kept my word, they will keep yours also. But all this they will do to you on my account. Remember, you're not in isolation. You're not uh, being tortured and punished because by yourself you're doing all this. No, 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 no. You're associated with Jesus. Remember, remember you're part of the vine. You see, you're not a branch that's just sticking out. People look at you not just as a mango branch, but as a mango tree. You are associated with the vine. You are associated with Jesus. And therefore, on his account, they are punishing you. They are doing all this. They are persecuting you. Because they do not him, they do not know him who sent me. They neither know the Father nor do they know Jesus. If I had not come and spoken to them, they would not have sin. But now that but now they have no excuse for their sin. Jesus is very clearly here talking about the people who rejected him. See, Jesus came unto his own. John writes in his first chapter, he came unto his own and his own received him not. They did not receive him. Jesus did not get a rousing welcome. No. Why did they send him to the cross? Because they could not stand him. They could see all his miracles. They could see all the good deeds that he did. They could see him healing people. They could see him say a lot of wonderful things. But all this they could not stand. They could not tolerate. Because Jesus says they belong to the world. But because Jesus has come and spoken, he now becomes the judge. You see, he becomes uh, a point of judgment where you either listen to him or disobey him. So they have chosen to disobey Jesus. And therefore, he says, they have no excuse for their sin. So Jesus now becomes a point of decision. You can either say yes to him or no to him. There's no being indifferent. There's no being, you know, this way, that way. You either follow him wholeheartedly, accept him or reject him. So for those who rejected him, they experience death and suffering. Those who accept him, they experience life and happiness. See? Verse 23. He who hates me, hates my father also. So it's all one. See, he says the father and I are one. So anyone who hates Jesus will also hate the father, which means God, who is the source of all goodness and love. If God is not accepted by people, that means they have automatically chosen the path of perdition. They have chosen not to be people of the kingdom. They have chosen not to follow God and his law, but they have chosen to live a godless life. That is what many people today are choosing. They are living a godless life where they have all the comforts, they have everything, but deep down they are empty. You cannot be happy. Your life cannot make sense if you live a godless life. You see, there are no two ways about it. Why today many people wake up depressed? Why today many people go to sleep with an empty heart? Because God has no place in their lives. They have everything. Their lives are busy. Morning to night, they are busy. What is our busyness? If in our busyness, God is not there, then our whole business is a waste of time. So we need to look at ourselves and see, am I like the world? Am I with the world? Am I on the broad path? Or am I with Jesus? Am I a person who follows the narrow path? 
if I had not done among them the works which no one else did, they would not have sinned. But now that they have seen and hated both me and my father. You see, they have seen all his works. They have seen everything. So um, they cannot be guiltless. You see, Jesus says they cannot be guiltless. You can't say, you know, how sad they don't know. No, 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 no. Jesus says they have seen, they have experienced everything they know. And they have chosen, they have decided to go against him, to disobey him. You see, therefore they remain guilty. Therefore, they have no excuse for their sin. Because Jesus says, I have done something which no one else has done. And by his resurrection, he will also show that he is going to do something that no one else has done. He will rise, which no other human being has done. So he will rise again. And in spite of that, they will reject him. You see, in spite of the resurrection, they will reject him. Verse 25, it is to fulfill the word that is written in their law. Their law it is written, they hated me without a cause. You see, they hated me without a cause. They're hating God without any reason because there's no valid reason for them to hate Jesus. Why are they hating him? Because they cannot tolerate him. They, their minds are so closed. See, all they want is this worldly life. And Jesus is not someone who makes that life easy for them. No, because it means to give up their cushy life. It means to give up all their evil practices and they don't want to give it up. And therefore, they hate him without a cause. So those who follow the world will hate the values of the kingdom. But when the counselor, the Holy Spirit comes, whom I shall send to you from the Father, even the Spirit of Truth, who proceeds from the Father, he will bear witness to me. And you also are witnesses because you have been with me from the beginning. So now when the Holy Spirit comes, he says after Pentecost he will come. On the day of Pentecost, the Spirit will be given to all those who believe in Jesus. When he comes, he will bear witness to me. And you will also be witnesses because you have seen me. So all those who have experienced God will be witnesses. They will be able to share this love of God with everyone. So you and I who have experienced God are also witnesses because we are called to live as those who have experienced the risen Lord as those who live a life of the Spirit, as those who are walking in the Spirit, walking the narrow path. So we are also called to be witnesses. And when we witness to this love of God, many others who are walking in darkness will turn to the Lord and we will start showing to 